Hello, this is Christian. Welcome to another video. In this video, let's talk about two very important APIs, or web APIs rather, called set timeout and set interval. And they're responsible for uh, something called we call it the asynchronous operations. So we know that JavaScript is a single threaded language. Again, think of a train that runs on a single track that is responsible for delivering all these, you know, people or in we call it messages. Uh, along this track, right? So if there's anything that's blocking this track, everything comes to a halt, and you don't want that to happen on your web web pages, website. So I explained in the previous video. If you haven't seen it, please go back and watch it about this event loop that is part of the uh, main thread inside the JS runtime on the browser. So it's responsible for interacting with the client and processing information and uh, uh, responding to the client based on the information it receives. And uh, along the way, if he receives any event that is, uh, is supposed to be put back to a, queue, a message queue like this here, this information will be delayed at a, at a later time, right? So that they'll get processed uh, separately. And at the end, of course, they will come back to the main thread and, uh, you know, return that information back to the client or the user. So that is a very important concept to understand asynchronous operations. And these two functions called set timeout and set interval is are um, usually used to, you know, kind of uh, mimic this multi-threaded uh, paradigm. So here again is the piece of code that we we're going to write and we'll see that in live code to see the order of, of execution of this code and how they are, um, you know, printed to the screen. So you can see the order here is completely different from the sequence of your code written over here. Okay, so uh, here again, it's just another diagram show you earlier that when you write your code based on the very first tick, anything that is on the first tick that is not being used uh, to call asynchronously, like the set timeout, then they will get processed immediately at this first tick. And then any code that is written inside or used um, inside this set timeout will be processed at least one tick later or beyond, depending on the time that you set to those functions. So let's go and take a look at how this is done in uh, in the code. All right, so I'm going to use um, this PHP Storm to illustrate this example. Again, you could use any idea of your choice if you want. I've used uh, Visual Studio Code in the past. Of course, you can use anything you want here. So I use this IDE because um, you'll see that and later when I run the code, you see the color and the uh, console is very beautiful. So I like that very much. All right, so let's go and create a new directory first. Let me call this one unit four. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go here and create a, um, a, mainly we're just gonna do a, a script. So I'm not too concerned about any web pages here. Okay, we just run everything in the terminal. So you'll see in the console. So I'm just basically need a script. And uh, what should we call this? Um, maybe web APIs. JS. All right. Okay. So uh, again, JS is a single threaded language. That means everything runs sequentially. So for example, if I have a variable called um, n <clears throat> is 10. And if you echo that out, of course, uh, not echo, um, I'm going to log it out. And you see that right away in, in that order, right? And if I have another variable called m is 20. And if I log that out, whoops. M, then you see that 20 comes after that. So in that order, everything runs sequentially. And all of these runs at an instance when it runs the code. And because I'm not using the set timeout or set interval functions, everything here runs on the single tick of that simp uh, uh, that very instance of that single tick at T0. Okay, so let's go to the terminal and run this. I mean, web2, I'm gonna go to unit four, and I run it using this node, all right? So you just type in node. Uh, and the name of the file called webapis.js. And you'll see that the result here is exactly what expected. Okay, so if you don't have Node, just make sure you install Node.js first. I'm running here through the Node interface environment. But you see that the 10 is printed here at line two, and then we assign M to 20. We print that out in that order. Okay, it's sequentially. If I were to remove move this line above, for example, if I move that above here, and I try to execute M first before it's being declared, you see that it's not it's not gonna work because M at this point is undefined. It's not until line four. So sequence sequential order is important 
uh, at this instance. So if I go back down here in my terminal and just press the up arrow to run it again, you see that you know this part's fine, but when I print M and say, hmm, where is M? That means above here, right? Above this this code, M is not there yet. Or well, that instance when that that very first cycle through the event cycle and it was not declared, it was not defined in memory, so therefore you get that problem. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that is a particular very common thing. However, if I do something like this, if I put um, into a function, say f of x, and I put this inside the function, then I mean it, it wouldn't matter, right? If I put that in there, and if I call instead of m, I call it f of x, and Okay, and then let's let's return it M here. Return M. Then of course functions are always it's going to be hoisted up out to the in this case to the global space. So uh, this would exist before you even invoke it, right? So function takes uh, precedence in this case. So it doesn't matter where you put your functions, it will always work in this order. Uh, not true for Python, right? But uh, in this case, yeah, it's no problem in JavaScript. So you can see that. My function can be declared any before or after, it doesn't matter. Uh, it depends, it's important where I invoke this. So I invoke it in line three. So if I go back in my code and I run it, you see that it runs just like expected in that order. And if I put that function call first, the way I move so quick, you see here, is I press the um, uh, shift alt or the alt shift, how you want to call it and you just press on the line. If you want to move multiple lines, just select the both of those lines and you move it and they'll move up and down like that, okay? And press the up and down arrow key. And so I was easily um, moving those, um, was able to move those lines quickly. So now I'm going to invoke fx first and I get the 20 and then the 10 becomes um, the second output here. So I reverse the order pretty much basically, that's what I did. Okay, so everything happens here uh, sequentially on the main thread, okay? So um, so now, what happens when I do the following? All right, so let's say that uh, I'll keep it as is. Um, yeah, so let's say I'm going to use this set timeout function. This function here takes two parameters, as you can see here. Uh, the first one is a function. It's a callback function, a function that returns something back. It's always called a callback function. You can use a separate function like f of x here like you have here. So if I want to use that, I just put that function here, okay? So don't invoke the function. If you invoke it, it won't work. It, it would work, but it will work in a very unexpected result. And usually you don't do that, okay? So you just leave it just the name of the function. And what this does is that it will wait until a certain time has expired. So by default, it will always be set to zero. Okay, so this zero here, is um, usually is the same as a one. So if you put one and zero, I think they're pretty much kind of the same here. Uh, if you, even though you put like a negative number, it will still be resorted to zero, I think. Okay, so the minimum is zero. It's measured in milliseconds. What that does is, what this function does is that when uh, you see this function, it will at least, you know, push this function into a separate tick. Okay, at least to the next tick, which is tick number two, right? So the first tick that comes through, all of this will run uh, until it finds one of, these, one of these functions. If it does, it will move that to the next tick, the next round. And by that time, then all of these would have been run. And so therefore, it's a, this is always one tick behind. Okay, you may hear that term. And so I'm, I'm delaying this function call now inside this set timeout. And... And because I've called this one here explicitly here and not inside the set timeout, of course, this is going to get called first. So I'm going to get the same result, 20. And then uh, this is delayed. And then so I'm going to print 10 next, right? So 10. And then finally, it will call all these functions. If I have a lot of them, those will get called uh, sequentially. And then we'll look at the time as well. That's also important. Okay, so in this case, my expected result would be I get a 20 because I called the f of x, and then I get a, get a 10, and then finally this one, I'm going to get 20 again. So 20, 10, 20, okay? So let's see. So I get, uh, well, oops, I did not invoke it. Um, I, I returned it, but I did not um, print anything. So let's, let's do something here really quick. 
um, let's print something here. I'm going to print it before I return, okay? So we can see the result. My bad. So let's say log m. Console log. So I'm going to log m in here. And it's going to mess up my, um, you know, my, my program here. Because if I do that, it's going to do it twice. Okay, so because I'm, I'm logging it twice. So I'm going to change turn off this log and just invoke it, okay? I want to print it twice. Okay, so let's try again. So I should get the same result as expected. I'm going to get 20, 20, and then 10, and then 20 again, okay? So um, as you can see here, result, you get 20, 10, 20. Okay, so um, because this one here doesn't matter what you call it in this case. If I move it above to the very top, again, Alt-Shift and up arrow, I move it to the very top. Okay, even though, you know, uh, it's up here, it doesn't really matter because at the first tick, it's going to move that to the second tick anyway, to the next round. Okay, so if I save this, again, I get the same result, 20, 10, 20, right? Okay, so that works um, just like that. And because the first tick already passed through, that means that the variable n has been uh, decreated in memory, it stays in RAM. So if I were to go into the function x here, and instead of m, I would put m times n, okay? And we'll, re we'll return here the same result, m times n. Now, I'm not using this for now. Well, I, I do, I, I, you know, log, put it here, but I, this is not really uh, used at this point. Okay, so you'll see that when I print this out, and let's make it a little bit interesting. I'm going to move the f of x here above it. Okay, before I declare the n. And as you can see, if you follow this through, you'll see there should be an error, all right? Because when I invoke the function at this point, all right, it goes in here, and m is declared, and then I log it, I log it here, m times n, but n was not declared until after the function call. So I should have a problem here at this line when I invoke line two, okay? And then after that, Everything here is done at the first tick. Now, with a, at the second tick, because I delay this function call at uh, using a set timeout function, at the second tick I come around, then I invoke the same f of x function. By that time, n has already been declared in memory. So therefore, I should be able to print 10 times 20. I should get 200 here, right? So let's save and see what happens down here in the console. Okay, so you see that First, when I invoke the f of x, right, that's the first thing. Well, actually, this one first, but it's a delay that, so we'll, we'll look at that for the next tick. And then it moves to f of x. f of x called, and then it tries to multiply m by n. At this point, n is undefined. Because n is undefined, and you try to multiply a number by undefined, what you get is called a not a number. That's what you see here, n, a, n stands for not a number, okay? Uh, it doesn't. It didn't crash your program in this case. Just throw you a weird error, um, a number result. And then after that, we declare n to be 20. I mean 10. We log that out, so you see 10 here. And then finally, there are no more code to run. So the second tick, the second cycle is, uh, you know, kicked into the uh, cycle. And then we call this function. We look at the timer. Oh, it's zero. That means call call this function immediately. Had this number be a different number, like a thousand or a different number, then it's going to wait until that time is reached or expired. In this case, zero means right away after the second tick. And so by that time, we invoke the function of x, and then we call this function again. So at this point, n has already been declared. So therefore, we're able to multiply 10 by 20, and we get 200. Okay, so that is how this set timeout function works. It's the same thing for the set interval, except for the set interval, it uh, constantly uh, running at a, a, a continuous cycle based on the uh, millisecond you set over here, right? So if I were to pull this, let's just say, as you notice, you run it, it's really quick. If I pull this into, let's just say, um, you know, three seconds, that's 3,000 milliseconds. That means by the time when I start, from t0 to after 3 seconds, then after 3 seconds expire, it's going to call this, you'll see that. So when you run in the command terminal, you'll see a slight delay, OK? 
Okay, so I'm going to count as best I can for three seconds. So you go, you go one, two, three, and then there it is, right? So it delays for three seconds. And this is important to understand, all right? So this time here, it, uh, it started from the time that you actually run the code, run the script, okay? And so uh, that's how this works. Now, let's say I have another function in here. I'll call it f of g, um, f of, I mean, uh, g of x. Okay, inside g of x, I'll just log this to the console also. I'll just call it um, uh, gx so we know what that is. And after I log that out, I will have another set timeout function, okay? This function is going to call another function called gx, I mean, h, hx. And this one will call after, we'll put another, another 3,000, uh, milliseconds here. So again, three seconds. So that means if, because um, um, this is nested inside the g of x, it depends how you call this. If I call it right away, then yeah, I, right away, like f of x, if I call that, it's going to print that right away. And then it's going to wait for three seconds for this to run. And then because they're at the same time, uh, I, in this case, usually this will run first and then that because the order is important. Again, depends what you call the g of x. Right, so after I call f of x, say that I'm going to call um, g of x down here. Okay, so g of x will run, <clears throat> it runs, and because this is not inside the set timeout, so it will, you know, uh, print that to the screen. You see that g of x comes right away, and then now we put this back into another uh, a tick. So I have to create this h of x here. So let's go down here, create another function called h of x. And then here, just put log um, hx. Okay, so what is the order here now? I'm gonna put some semicolon here, just to make my code consistent. Okay, let me turn this off. You can kind of see um, down here. All right. So we, if you trace this code during the first tick, it calls this timeout push that to the second tick or later, in this case, three seconds later. Um, and then we call the f of x. So the first thing we should do, we should see is the m times n. Again, this would be a n, a n, right? Not a number. And then it calls the g of x. The g of x is called, we're gonna see this right away. You see the g of x. Uh, I'll put that no here for now, okay? So the first is you get a net n a n. And then we call the g of x, and this is going to be called the number two is uh, gx. And then it calls this function here again. Oh, pull this again at the next track at 3000. So from the t0, this is still the same time as this. Okay, they're being raised at the same time. And because this is being called first, I'm expecting this to run first before this. So we'll see. Okay, so after that, then uh, this is going to run. This is not the next thing it runs here is not on the timeout, so we invoke that, and then this is on the main thread. So this is number three. We're gonna get a uh, ten, All right? So after ten, then no more code run except these functions. So now it goes back to the second cycle. Second cycle kicks in. This works called first. So we're gonna go into f of x. And we check the timer is three seconds. After three seconds is reached, they both at the same time, so they're racing against each other, right? Because I uh, this is run first, we're gonna call it f of x. And so the second time around, this time, at the number three, uh, number four, we're gonna get 200. And then finally, because this is called after the uh, timeout, and they're at the same time, and you can't run, you know, display two at once, um, again due to a single thread then we're going to see this output down here um, when this runs and then i'll put here at the number five is you get hx okay so let's see if this is correct all right so let's go to a terminal again and i closed it so let's go to unit four and then i'm going to clear my console and run node web apis.js and let me just kind of make some space down here and here we go uh, so what do we see here, right? There was a delay. You saw there's a delay for a couple seconds. So we see that the first one was an NAN, as you can see. And then we expect the second to be GX, and that's what we got. And then the third is expected a 10, so we got a 10. 
and then we expect the next one to be 400 because again they are the same seconds. This is based on the on the uh, constant time. Since they are the same time, then the sequence of of these functions being called uh, takes precedence. So f of x was called first, so we get that here um, uh, the number four, which is this uh, 200, and then finally we call the g of x, the h of x down here, and then we get the h of x. Okay, and just to prove that it's true, if I put this two two seconds instead of three seconds, okay. So if I do that way, then the last two here is just going to be reversed. So you're going to see the h of x first before the 200 because you know the two seconds comes before the three seconds based on the global or constant time. And let's see that it's true. So I'm going to go and just run that code again. And they go a couple seconds. And there you see. So you see that the um, everything here above is the same except the last two because the the Three seconds is you know happens after the two second time, right? So you see that the h of x was printed here before the two hundred. Okay, so uh, basically that's how these two functions uh, work: set timeout and set interval. Um, they are being uh, delayed for at least one tick behind the main thread, the this the the very first tick of your code, and sometimes this can be very tricky but also very useful when you run your application on the browser when that single tick can play a significant difference in your code. Okay, um, so I'm just to illustrate the last piece here is the set timeout. I want to show you here how much time has passed since we run the code. So you can do something like uh, the following. Um, say we have a, um, I'm going to bar here, t start is, we start from zero, this is time start zero, and I'll print that out right away, right? So if you log at t star, you're gonna get zero right away. Put here start. So t star right away, and then I'm gonna set a time here. So set interval. This is the syntax here is kind of similar. So you put another function, uh, and then you load uh, based on that second. So I'll just use anonymous function here. So just the arrow function. Oops, arrow function. And then the second parameter, if you put it back so you can see a little bit nicer, it is the time. So by default is zero. Zero means every every zero milliseconds, that's very, very fast. So I'm gonna pause it for every second. So that means after every 1000 milliseconds, run this code inside here. So what I'm gonna do is gonna I'm gonna print that out to the console. Okay, it's gonna log that out and say um, cur time. So you can see what that width that is. Um, well, I mean time in in um in a, say I should say elapsed time, but at least you know what the time is and measure in seconds. So from zero, it's gonna come every second. It's what I'm trying to show here. So how do we do that? Well, um, you know what I should do? Uh, right above here, I need to put a um. L let me modify this a little bit. This will be zero, and no matter what. I'll start at zero, but time start. I'm gonna do a new date. Okay, just make it simple. When I run the code, it's run the date, and here, um, this is the main time, right? The constant time. So over here, I'm just gonna do a um, uh, the new date again. So get the current time at this time when this thing runs for the first second, and then it may not be exactly one second. Okay, you're not gonna get exactly second. Uh, this are some delta values, minus from the start time, which is t start. So that will be um, fixed initially, right? And then you get a difference in time. So it will run every second. So every second, this will be printed to the console, okay? And then you see that after three seconds, you will see um, the the uh, um, this result. And then after one two seconds, you see the result. So to make it a little bit more exciting, let's put here. After five seconds, you see that. After three seconds, I'm going to see the h of x. Oops. Okay. So here we go. And let's see what happens down here. I'm going to clear my console and let's run the code. There we go. Zero. Um, oh, my number is incorrect. I should have um, divided by a zero. Okay. So yeah, let's pause here. Control. Let's do one more time. This is actually measured in milliseconds, so it should be 1.000 a second. 
Uh, let's fix that. That means I need to wrap this with a minus a thousand. Okay. So I get in 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 seconds, but I did not use the floor. So you're gonna get one point zero zero eight seconds, but which is fine. Okay, and so let's try one time. Here we go. Time zero, and then one, two, three, and four, five, six, and so on. Okay, let's stop that. So you can see that at time zero, we printed the nan and then the gx and then the ten. Okay, and then it it's done there. So it goes to the set timeout, and we have to wait that for five seconds. <clears throat> right, but that's gonna five seconds. So after t uh, five seconds, you will see the two hundred be printed. So you can see that after four seconds, at the very fifth second here, that it's being printed, and that this is printed after three seconds. So you can see after the three seconds here, right at around the same time, we print that out. Okay, so uh, that's just to prove that yeah, it it it's race uh, it's racing against or on that constant time when we initially started. Okay, and when you have uh, these functions being called here, whether they are uh, nested or not, um, they are the time here is, at, I believe, it's calculated based on the constant time. So whichever time occurs first will get executed. So when you run a nested function inside of f of x, like I have here, I mean like g of x, uh, like I have here, then this will be um, uh, added to the initial time if you run that inside another set timeout. Okay, so what I meant was, if I were to call this inside a set timeout, then it's going to be different, right? So it's going to be whatever that time is. If it's zero, then it would be zero plus this, and this is still going to run first. Um, so the total time here is important when you run uh, this kind of uh, code. But the order here is uh, not that important when you have, if you run the same tick, and they have, they have different time over here, so this one takes precedence. I hope this is not too confusing. But uh, this is a very important concept, uh, how to understand, about understanding how asynchronous works in uh, JavaScript. Okay, so um, I hope this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, how this works. And in the next video, we're going to do a uh, Ajax application to show you how you can um, use not set time up, but something similar to fetch data from a different site. And that's important because when you do that kind of uh, um, operations when you are reaching out to a different site or server side to grab data, you don't want your script to come to a halt. If it does, then you know you're going to lose uh, you know, customers and you lose client because your your site will come to a halt. All right, so I will stop here. And if there's anything here that is uh, confusing, or if you don't understand something here in the code, um, or if you just have any, you know questions about it, please let me know and I'll be more than happy to answer. So thank you for watching and uh, see you next time.